The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Sami Shah. This is Ear to Asia. Indonesian voters' average age is 30. They have no memories of the oppressive and abusive new order of Tsuharto. Prabowo's human rights abuses alleged against him. They are pretty much untroubled by that dark past. They're not that worried about Prabowo's claims of going back to the new order period because they don't know it. I'm not convinced at all that Prabowo's interest in Jokowi extends a lot beyond riding his popularity to gain the prize of the presidency, which he now has that. And it will be managing Jokowi insofar as he continues to be useful to him. And if he's not, it would be a matter of trying to sideline him. In this episode, how will Indonesia fare under new president Prabowo Subianto? Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. Indonesia's presidential election, held in February of this year, marked a pivotal moment in the country's young democracy. After two terms under President Jokowi Widodo, the world's third largest democracy has elected controversial figure Prabowo Subianto as its next leader in a sweeping victory. Prabowo's rise to the presidency, of course, invites greater scrutiny of his past, his policy positions and what his leadership could mean for Indonesia's future. With a reputation marred by human rights violations and anti-democratic rhetoric, Prabowo nevertheless gained widespread support, especially among young voters. His selection of Jokowi's son as running mate also shocked many. So, what are we to expect in Indonesia after Prabowo assumes his country's highest office in October? Domestically, will he pursue a stance of continuity from the Jokowi era? Or will he act decisively to put his own stamp on things? How are Indonesia's international relations likely to shift under Prabowo, a long-time military commander and defence minister under Jokowi? And what are the prospects for the health of Indonesia's democracy given Prabowo's ties to the new order era of legendary strongman Suharto? Joining me to discuss Prabowo's victory and where Indonesia goes from here are veteran Indonesia observers and regular Ear to Asia guests, Professor Tim Lindsay, who is Malcolm Smith Chair of Asian Law at Melbourne Law School, and political sociologist Dr. Ian Wilson of Murdoch University. Welcome back to Air to Asia, Tim and Ian. Thanks, Sammy. Good to be back. There's been a lot of press recently about Prabowo Subianto and his backstory. But just for listeners who need to be brought up to speed, Tim, could you give us a nutshell biography of the man and his reputation to date? Thanks, Sammy. Very hard to do this one in a nutshell, I'm afraid. It's a complex history. I think the first thing to note is that Subianto is deeply entrenched in Indonesia's elite. He's a real blue blood. He's part of the establishment, uh, whatever maverick behaviour he's been engaged in, he is part of that elite. He, his family claimed descent from a legendary hero of the 19th century, Deepan Ogoro, who led a revolution against the Dutch. His grandfather was a leader in the independence movement and a founder of Indonesia's first state bank. His father rebelled against the first president, Sukarno, but went on to become Minister of Finance and Trade and Research under President Suharto. His younger brother, Hashim, is a wealthy tycoon. So this is a real establishment family. And that was reflected in the fact that as an ambitious young military officer serving mainly in the special forces, he went on to marry a daughter of President Suharto, and rose then finally to become the commander of a key position in the military forces, the Strategic Reserve in Jakarta, just around the time that his father-in-law's repressive new order regime began to disintegrate. Now, as Suharto's regime, and I think Prabowo's hopes for possible succession began to disintegrate, a special forces brigade he was then head of special forces before becoming head of the strategic reserve a special forces rose brigade was involved in abducting and torturing more than 20 student protesters and 13 of them have never come back presumed dead probo as the commander of that group has admitted to the abductions although he denies being involved in any killings 
He's never faced trial on these allegations, although several of his men have been tried and convicted. He also denies a range of other allegations relating to human rights abuses committed by special forces under his command, in particular in East Timor, but also in Papua, including one episode where it's claimed that a helicopter disguised as a Red Cross helicopter was used to draw villagers out into a clearing and a, a massacre took place after that. He also denies accusations that he was involved in engineering the violent rioting in Jakarta in 1998 that contributed to the collapse of his father-in-law's regime. That was likely the result of a struggle within the armed forces by various generals who hoped to become Suharto's successor. But Prabowo was clearly involved in those events. He was, I think, hoping to climb high amid the chaos at the time. Now, when Suharto finally resigned in 1998, his successor, the former vice president, Habibi, declined Prabowo's request to become head of the army and, in fact, demoted him. And it's said that Prabowo then responded by arming himself with a pistol and a couple of truckloads of troops and driving straight to the palace. And bursting into the palace, he was stopped outside the president's office from carrying out what a lot of people have said since was a coup attempt. The result of all this, the involvement in all these events, was that he was, a few months later, thrown out of the army, honourably discharged for misinterpreting orders. Now, nobody really quite knows what went on, and the exact official reason for his dismissal is still a little mysterious, but it ended his military career, and he disappeared off in voluntary exile outside Indonesia, and it seemed that his ambitions for high office were finished. Well, if you couple all of that with several on-the-record statements being critical of Indonesia's democratic reforms that have been rolled out since the fall of Suharto and the New Order, what has been his sudden path into democratic governance now? Well, he returned from that voluntary exile and reinvented himself. And this is a pattern throughout his life of this constant reinvention. By 2009, he was a wealthy business figure and he'd founded his own political party, Garindra, and rehabilitated himself sufficiently to make a bid for power running as a vice presidential candidate with former President Megawati Sukarno Putri. That was his first shot. Maybe the coup attempt in 1998 was the first. This was the second shot at the palace. They lost in a huge landslide. In 2014, he tries again, this time running against the incumbent now, Joko Widodo, Prabowo runs as a sort of nationalist strong man riding his horse into stadiums with cheering uniform supporters and promising to unravel the democratic system that had gone too far and return to the authoritarian model of the new order of Suharto, his former father-in-law. He lost that election too. And in 2019, he tried once again, once more against Jokowi, this time on an Islamic platform, turning to conservative Islamists, trying to ride a wave out of the protests a few years earlier against the Christian Chinese governor of Jakarta, Ahok, trying to exploit that movement. He ran as an Islamic figure. It was a strange choice as a figurehead for the Islamist movement, given he had a Christian mother and brother, and was never known particularly for his public piety. But he ran that election, a polarizing election, I think, that strengthened the hand of hardline Islamist groups for years to come, deep intentions and so on. He lost that election. He accused Jokowi of cheating. Rioting broke out in Jakarta. Eight people died. He challenges it in the Constitutional Court. That also fails. And so, once again, Prabowo reaches this moment in his life where there's been another major political catastrophe. And at that point, he took this extraordinary decision to rethink himself again, this time by joining forces with his former enemy. So his new frenemy suddenly became President Jokowi. Ian, I want to ask you about this just to briefly perform an election post-mortem for us. And was Prabowo always going to win this contest? Did it seem inevitable or was there a chance it could have gone in any other direction? Yeah, sure. Just to add to what Tim was saying, and I think it's relevant in looking at Prabowo's post-New Order political strategy, within the military, he was very much renowned for his thinking around proxy warfare many of the allegations that have been levelled credibly against him have been, to an extent, plausibly deniable because one of the strategies he used throughout his military career was to develop civilian militias, which he did in East Timor. 
He was linked to the stealing of Tim Rees' children, of bringing Tim Rees to Jakarta, and many of them were groomed into gangs that became really fundamental to a particular kind of politicking uh, that was engaged in the streets. And I think he's maintained that kind of a uh, strategic proxy war approach throughout his post-New Order political career, as Tim was pointing out, his alignment with Islamists. Anyone who knows Prabol knows he's no fan of Islamists, in, and in particular, the people that he shared a stage with in the campaign. It's easy to imagine another context where he'd be happy to have them rounded up. But he certainly was able to see the strategic value of aligning with these kinds of interests. And so if we come into the present, I think that also helps to explain how he's managed to get to this point now. Uh, he, rather than railing against the popularity of Jokowi, which he you know, he lost twice doing that, he took a longer approach, becoming a minister and then campaigning explicitly as a continuation of a deeply popular president. And that's a really interesting point there, because it does raise the question, and I want to ask you this, is to what extent was the election a referendum then on Jokowi's two terms as president? Yeah, look, I think you can you can arguably say that people, when they voted for Prabol, also voted for Jokowi. And if you look at his results in 2014 and 2019 and coming into 2024, he'd kept probably around 30% of rusted on kind of supporters, people who liked him for what they saw either way. But that wasn't enough to win him the presidency. And so the Jokowi effect, effectively, I think, did it for him. And he was very explicit in this idea of continuity to a, a population who maybe is risk averse at this time. The idea of change, which was an explicit campaign strategy of his rival, Anis Baswedan, captured, it's looking around 25% of the vote, but many people liked the idea of stability and continuity. And so despite his relatively extreme past, Prabhupada really uh, framed himself as the centrist candidate, the one who would be a, a continuation of things that people liked uh, about Jokowi. Um, you know, and if we want to move into, in, into the future, I mean, I, I've been a bit aghast, particularly at analysts who've really taken what I thought was a campaign pitch and assumed that that's what he's going to do. I mean, this guy's been obsessed with the presidency for over two decades. As Tim pointed out, he feels extremely entitled to power. Uh, and the idea that he would simply now take supreme office after all of this effort, and at 72, he's probably not going to be in the role for a long time. I'd say it's absolutely certain that he's got very specific things that he's going to do. And Jokowi, I think a bit like the Islamists uh, in 2019, has probably already largely served his purpose. How he'll manage him going forward is a big open-ended question, I think. And we'll see that unfold in the next few months as he tries to cobble together his ruling coalition once the legislative results are finalised as well. Yeah, I'll just jump in there Ian, and say that he's a very proud man. He's, as you say, in a hurry, and he's not likely to be a puppet of Jokowi. I think one of Jokowi's reasons for allying with Prabolo was that Jokowi has a two-term limit. He can't serve a third term. He needs to find some way of maintaining political influence by placing his son on Prabowo's ticket as a vice presidential candidate, he has a sort of link that would allow him to sit in the background as a kingmaker. At least I think that's his aspiration. The vice presidential office is actually very weak in Indonesia. It has no guaranteed powers in the constitution. It gets what the president gives. But it's not so much that Jokowi's son would wield power. It's more that it's an avenue for influence for Jokowi in the years ahead. I think that's Jokowi's thinking. But I agree with Ian. I'm not sure that... Prabo is willing to be anyone's puppet or even a partner for all that long, having waited for his entire life to achieve this. And I think it's quite likely that he may eventually break with Jokowi. And if that happens, I don't think it'll happen soon, but I think it's probably going to happen at some point, particularly if there's a second term for Prabo. And if that happens, I think that would create a major crisis in Indonesian politics and a dramatic reconfiguration of the political elite. Yeah, I tend to agree. I, I don't think he would move too quickly because, I mean, fundamental to him being able to manage the office is to develop eventually his own substantial popularity base. I mean, he's clearly ridden a lot on Jokowi's popularity to this point, despite having those who like him for what he is or appears to be at least. 
Um, but he will need to consolidate that in the presidency, I think, before he makes any major moves to, if he was to alienate Jokowi. I mean, that could be done very subtly. It doesn't have to be a dramatic thing that a lot of people would even really notice. It would be a simple fact that Jokowi wasn't influencing thing when he's no longer president. What does he have? He doesn't have a political party. He attempted through the small PSE, which his other son is the chair of. It doesn't look like they're going to reach the threshold of 4% to have representation in national parliament. He fell out with the PDIP, which is his former party, who I'm sure are looking for an opportunity to get revenge. Certainly Megawati is well known for not tolerating that kind of behavior. So I think in many respects, he's quite vulnerable. Uh, he will be vulnerable uh, once Prabhu feels he doesn't need to appear to be on side with him. I think it's worth just mentioning one thing that happened yesterday, and that was that President Jokowi bestowed an honorary four-star general status on Prabowo. Uh, and this is really kind of a full circle moment where, you know, him being discharged from the military was his grand humiliation that has driven him quite obsessively to redeem his name in his own mind. And I think that was the cream on top of the cake kind of thing to fully restore his name, certainly to some, and to try and, and clean his image to those who still have doubts in their mind about his past. And clearly an effort by Jokowi to cement his relationship with Prabowo into the future. I want to take a moment here just to pause and direct our attention towards Jokowi's eldest son. You've been talking about him quite a bit. Prabowo's selection of Gibran Raka booming Raka was seen by many as controversial, even scandalous. Why is that? Sammy, it is highly controversial. And just let me answer that by talking about two things. First, why it's controversial and then voters' reactions. The problem was that to cut this deal whereby Jokowi would join with Prabowo, meaning that the block of votes, a substantial amount of the block of votes that would normally go to Jokowi shifts across to Prabowo, the way that was done was to get his son on the ticket. And that was not straightforward because there was a provision in the election law that said that presidential and vice presidential candidates had to be aged 40. However, the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court, Anwar Usman, just happened to be Gibran's uncle and therefore Jokowi's brother-in-law. And the court, in due course, delivered a ruling reinterpreting the law to allow younger candidates to run if they had been previously elected as a regional head. And, of course, it just so happens that Gibran, who some call the Nepo baby in Indonesia, just happens to have been mayor of the city of Solo position his dad, Jokowi, once held. And therefore, he was eligible. Now, this caused an uproar because the conflict of interest of the Chief Justice was blatant. He shouldn't have sat on that matter. An ethics council of the Constitutional Court was called and decided that it was unethical. And they removed the Chief Justice as Chief Justice, although he remains a judge on the court. Not only does he remain a judge on the court, but no change was made to the decision because that was probably impossible. And so, out of that, Gibran gets onto Brabo's ticket and the rest is history. Now, that has caused a major controversy in Indonesia. So have allegations that the government has interfered, has not been neutral and has allowed government officials to effectively campaign and use government resources to, to support Brabo. These are scandalous matters, but it's really had not much effect on voters. And the reason for that is that um, we have to remember that Indonesian voters' average age is 30 and that means most of them are about three or four years old when Suharto fell from power. They have no memories of the oppressive and abusive new order of Prabowo's um, the human rights abuses alleged against him. They are pretty much untroubled by that dark past. They're not that worried about Prabowo's claims of going back to the new order period because they don't know it and they don't remember it. They're also not particularly troubled by the constitutional court scandal because political scandals of that kind are hardly unusual in Indonesia. Instead, a lot of them were captivated by the fairly canny campaign strategy by the Prabowo Gibran team to present them as cute, the cute grandpa and the cool young dude Gibran. This was saturation, social media advertising everywhere, anime figures, giant screens of cartoon versions of Brabowa and Gibran winking at people in a somewhat odd fashion. And I think this sort of cool Gibran, cute Brabowa imagery backed by the charisma of Jokowi was what they were interested in. I think they saw this 
as a vote for the continuance of Jokowi's policies and the next best thing to Jokowi. And hey, these guys are cute and the political scandals and the past just simply weren't important to most of them. Let's take a step back now and ask what, in terms of the Indonesian national legislature, will be the effect on the pecking order for political parties going forward now? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the current status of the legislature, it hasn't changed radically from previous election. The PDIP, which was the party of Jokowi, but they uh, backed presidential candidacy of Ganjar Pranowo, who was a two-term governor of central Java. The PDIP actually did very well, despite the fact that Ganja was the worst of the three presidential candidates, only getting around 17%. In fact, he lost very heavily in areas like Bali, for example, where the PDIP completely dominates politics for some time. This creates a kind of an interesting scenario as to where parties that won quite large numbers of seats, how they're going to situate themselves in relation to President Prabowo. Indonesia system really revolves around presidential coalitions and the trend certainly over Jokowi has been to have ruling coalitions of almost everybody at this point in time. He has 91% of all of the national legislature in his ruling coalition. There's effectively only one party now, the PKS, Islamic Party, that's outside of his ruling coalition. Prabowo has said in his campaign that he wants to have a government that includes everybody. And, you know, to an electorate, that's often a quite appealing and comforting rhetoric. We're not going to have conflict. I'm going to have everyone in one big happy family ruling coalition. What it also means, however, is a fundamental further shift in the dynamics of Indonesian politics away from an oppositional model. So there will be effectively, if he's able to do so, I'm, I'm dubious that he will. And some parties are are looking like they're going to dig in a bit, at the very least, not as a principled stance, but to be able to leverage more out of the president, it would effectively mean there will be no opposition. Uh, and that's been the trend under Jokowi as well, by not overtly repressing opposition, though opposition parties like the Democrats, who just joined his coalition, but they were subject to kind of harassment and attempts to divide the party. The PKS was subject to some kinds of investigation and criminalisation. And this fits Prabowo's ideological preferences and his understanding of what he considers the authentic Indonesian political system, one that's not based on an oppositional party parliamentary model. This has been very clear throughout his political career. It's enshrined in the manifesto of his political party, Gurindra, the Greater Indonesia Party, which explicitly states that it considers amendments to Indonesia's constitution after 1998. And these were the amendments that really underpin multi-party elections, regional decentralization, regional autonomy, human rights provisions, term limits on the presidency, all seen as key achievements of the post-Suhado era. His party argues that these are liberal democratic approaches to politics. They're antithetical to the Indonesian way. They're hostile to the state ideology of Pancasila. And ultimately, the objective of the party is to roll those back to the original constitution, which is based on a consensus model, and it also concentrates power in the executive, in particular, the presidency. So they have this objective. It will be a matter of of how this plays out with the interests of parties themselves and how they want to align themselves. Yeah, and we've seen a whole process of democratic regression under President Joko Widodo, attacks on core institutions like the Constitutional Court and the Anti-Corruption Commission, both of which have been significantly undermined in the, in the eyes of most observers are nothing like the guarantors of good governance that they once had been. And I think the decision to reinterpret the election law to put Gibran on the ticket for Prabowo is the most recent and classic example of that, but we've also seen the head of the Anti-Corruption Commission charged with corruption. In addition to that, attacks on civil society, critics of government have been charged with defamation and under various other laws. And that is certainly not going to get any better under Prabowo. If anything, I think we will see this trend of democratic regression and restriction of rights, attacks on civil society, increase. I don't think there's going to be a dramatic and sudden return of the 1945 constitution, but it is certainly on the agenda and it could well happen later on in the term once President Prabowo feels more secure.
and more settled because a return to the 45 constitution, quite apart from his ideological commitments to it, would make his position almost unassailable. It would get rid of elections. It would leave the choice of a new president in the hands of the legislature, which he would be able to control. So it is an attractive proposition. It's just a question of how powerful he becomes. But nobody should be fooled into thinking that Indonesia's democratic regression is going to reverse under Prabowo. That ain't going to happen. But I'd say one other thing too about that, which is that the question about opposition, the only possibility of an opposition is maybe President Megawati's party, PDIP, will choose to go into opposition as it has done in the past under President Yudhoyono. And it did so under President Yudhoyono because Megawati, the leader of PDIP, considered that Yudha Yono had betrayed her by resigning from her cabinet, running against her and winning. And she then initiated a grudge war against Yudha Yono that still continues today. And I think Megawati will have the same view about Jokowi, who was a member of her party, who turned his back on the party, endorsed Prabowo, leading to a crushing defeat of PDIP's candidate Gunjar, as, as Ian has said. I think she will also be motivated very likely to seek her revenge in a grudge war against Jokowi, for which Reid also Prabowo, and she might take the party into opposition. It would be a you know less than 20% opposition, but we might end up seeing, as Ian says, this massive overwhelming majority coalition with PDIP as the only party in opposition. It was quite a disruptor under Yudhoyono, but I'm not sure it'll be able to do that under Prabowo. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners from Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Sammy Shah, and I'm joined by political sociologist Dr. Ian Wilson and Asia law expert Professor Tim Lindsay. We're talking Indonesia and its prospects, as Prabowo Subianto is set to resume the presidency. Subianto won't assume the office of the president until October 2024. What happens over the many months between now and then? Ian, let's start with you. This is probably an even more interesting period than the elections per se, because there's going to be a lot of deal making, a lot of negotiations, firstly, around what Prabowo's ruling coalition might look like. What is he going to offer to who? And there's already been leaks, I think they were fakes actually, of proposed cabinet listings of who's going to have their support, you know, returned with positions. And this is against the context where Jokowi, who of course is a completely unneutral supporter of the Prabowo ticket, remains the president with full presidential powers. Uh, and as many are observing, he's not really holding back in creating greater sort of leeway and support uh, one of the key sort of populist policy ideas that Prabowo ran with was for a free lunch. And by free lunch, that's free lunch to school age children throughout the country, which was pitched as addressing really deep structural problems in Indonesia around childhood stunting and malnutrition. It's a, a very popular program, but of course, it is going to be extremely expensive. $29 billion. Uh, and even in the past few days, there was uh, reports uh, in the Indonesian media that there'd already been discussions within the Jokowi cabinet about how this could be fit within the budget going forward to 2025. So you have the current government trying to find ways to fund a policy, a populist policy, and I think it will be a real economic burden policy for Indonesia. So you can see how the current administration is, is really working to make things easier for Prabowo. And I think that's going to be something we're going to see more of in the months ahead. Speaking of policies, what are the real policy priorities for Indonesia right now then? And how do you see Prabowo addressing them, if at all? There's many things that could be said here. I think one of the main challenges facing Indonesia as a middle-income country is inequality. In Indonesia still has the sixth highest income inequality levels in the world. This means that many Indonesians, whilst they're not technically poor, according to standard definitions, live in conditions of deep economic precariousness. And I think certainly in terms of the campaign, that was something that 
I thought was quite cynically addressed through, you know, offers of essentially free food and other things like that. But that's going to be the real challenge for the country is to manage not falling into a middle income trap and to mitigate the socioeconomic impacts of income inequality. Uh, and they're big structural issues. There's really nothing, certainly in the Prabowo campaign, that addresses that other than, you know, highlighting a continuation of Jokowi's focus on industrial downstreaming, nickel, for example, and the new resource sectors in particular as centres of economic growth. But to the extent to which that's going to flow into such a vast country still really remains up in the air. And one of the problems about Indonesian elections is that they are, surprisingly enough, almost complete policy vacuums. There's almost no serious debate or discussion of policy and really no competition on policy between candidates. Generally, they agree on most issues. And so we don't really know what the policy settings of Prabowo's government are going to be until they go through this eight-month period of horse trading and deal-making to try and work out the political coalition that will eventually be the means through which Prabowo rules. Now, that coalition is going to be determined by deals cut with oligarchs, enormously wealthy business figures who effectively control the political process through various political parties. And, you know, that will be what you'd expect it to be, pretty dirty deals, ensuring that oligarchs maintain monopolies and access to benefits and so forth. It'll keep them wealthy. So when all that deal making is done, some of those wealthy business figures have spent enormous amounts on campaigning and expect rewards from it, and they will want seats or seats for proxies in cabinet and so forth when that's all sorted out we'll know who's in cabinet and in particular we'll then know who's in charge of the important policy making ministries such as finance and trade and only then will we really know what the policy settings are going to be and how they're going to afford the free lunches and so on and indeed if that still makes it through so we've got eight months of waiting before we find out but one thing that does matter is as Ian said, there was a, a sort of supposed cabinet listing leaked from Prabowo's team, which may or may not be accurate, but it had almost no technocrats on it at all. Everybody in it were political cronies, allies, or figures from Prabowo's past and so on, or people who you might expect as part of the campaign deals would get a seat. We don't know if it's going to look like that, but if it does, then that is highly problematic for Indonesia because since early in Suharto's new order regime, there have always been technocrats occupying those sort of key ministries, and they are very important for ensuring trust from outside Indonesia that Indonesia's economy is in safe hands and so on. One of the big problems Suharto had towards the end of his regime was, was that his last cabinet lacked technocrats and was one of the reasons for loss of confidence in Indonesia. So... If we don't have a sufficiently technocratic cabinet, appointments in key ministries, that's going to really affect the flow of foreign investment into Indonesia. Getting foreign investment is a key part of Jokowi's policy platform, and Indonesia has always struggled to get sufficient foreign investment. So that's something to watch out for, I think. That's the domestic policy. What about foreign relations? What about Prabowo's relationship with China, the US, the region? How do you think that's going to play out? Ian, let's start with you. Yeah, look, I think in broad terms, Indonesia's foreign policy status quo of non-alignment will stand. Prabowo will, uh, and you've seen this already in how he's behaved as Minister for Defence, he'll want to maintain generally amicable relations with the United States and with China. I understand that the apprehensions may be in neighbouring countries, including the government of Australia, really revolves around Prabowo's personality traits, uh, known to be quite volatile, moody, defensive, uh, and the impacts that this may have certainly on managing diplomatic relations, but how it may flow into policy. But I guess the double bind and trying to sound at least remotely optimistic, it might hopefully temper some of his impulses that he does need to maintain a friendliness to foreign investment if he's going to deliver on many of the things that he wants to deliver. So that really means he's going to have to not be antagonistic or to play foreign policy issues to a domestic audience by being overtly nationalistic and uh, and all that kind of thing. As Tim was saying, it will come down to who gets those key portfolios. You know, the current foreign minister, I think, has been broadly recognised as pretty, pretty competent and done a, a reasonable job, but it seems that she's unlikely to continue in that role. So it's really going to come down to 
who's in that uh, position. But I think broadly speaking, we're not going to see a deep shift. There's been chatter in Indonesia, particularly around the issue of Israel and Palestine and how in the past Prabol has shown a deep openness to reinstating diplomatic relations between Indonesia and Israel. Indonesia does not have diplomatic relations with Israel. It has a long-standing foreign policy position that supports Palestinian independent statehood. But again, I think what would be a radical shift in Indonesia's foreign policy would have significant domestic implications. It would be deeply unpopular and disruptive. So I think for the main, it will be a continuation of what we've seen. You know, I think Prabowo, he is volatile, he's mercurial, he is quick to anger, he's a proud man, but he's also extremely pragmatic and a strategist and is willing to turn on a dime, as they say, if one path is pragmatically more appealing or more likely to be successful than the other. He is not a fool. And I think Indonesia is in a quite a similar place to Australia. It depends heavily on China's economy. It wants more money from China, but it's nervous about the security implications of it. I don't think the two countries are all that different. And I think Prabowo understands that. Well, also worth noting that Prabowo, because his father was in exile for involvement in a rebellion against the first president, Sukarno, who's actually spent a lot of his youth overseas, graduated from educational institutions in Europe, as well as Southeast Asia, and has studied, done military training and so forth in the US. So he's actually quite comfortable internationally, perhaps more so than many other politicians, certainly more so than Jokowi. And I think he is actually quite adept on the international stage. So I agree, I don't think there's going to be much change. And I think that Roboa may surprise people at being better at handling international relations than Jokowi, who is not really interested. What about Australia? You mentioned our similarities with Indonesia. What about our relationship with Indonesia? Does a Prabowo presidency mean any changes there? Dealing with Prabowo is something Australian governments have already done because he's been Minister for Defence for the last five years or so under Jokowi. And He's visited Australia in that role. And in fact, there's negotiations going on right now about a defence agreement between Australia and Indonesia in which Prabowo played an important role. So our government has experience of dealing with Prabowo. I don't think that they will find it disruptive from that personal point of view. I think what will be problematic in the future is that as democratic regression increases, and we start seeing attacks on civil society and the human rights issues that have marked Prabowo's career from the early years come up again, and that may put Australia in a difficult position. But for now, I think they're just taking a very deep breath and getting ready to deal with another difficult international politician. Yeah, I I mean, I tend to agree. I think, you know, and we've already seen that from Australia at United States that, you know, Prabowo's human rights record mattered until it became too difficult for it to matter. He was barred from the US by three different presidents and under Trump, when he became Minister for Defence, you know, that was lifted almost immediately and Australia's position has been largely the same. Pragmatism will prevail, you know, even if there are greater levels of political repression. I mean, we've already seen some of that in terms of democratic regression under Jokowi and the Australian government really hasn't said anything about it. I don't think that's going to be a point of tension because that reflects broader shifts where, you know, human rights is really concerned with democratic substance is a strategic concern rather than necessarily a principled concern. I know that sounds very cynical, but I think it's pretty accurate in the Australian case if we look at how we've seen shifts in where priorities for funding in Indonesia go, where there's been a big walk away from investments in encouraging democratic governance, et cetera, to the embeddedness of technical advisors you see these shifts over the last decade. So again, I think there may be the odd moment that comes up, but for the most part, I mean, we've already seen Richard Miles visit Prabowo in his capacity as defence minister just last week. We've seen the Australian Defence Force chief visit him uh, last week as well. It's obviously they're very keen to keep things smooth sailing ahead. So it's going to take something pretty radical to really disrupt that or put Australia in a position where they feel they have to change their stance or make a statement of some kind. Yeah, and they both have the same view on China as well. And, you know, they will be 
interested in shoring each other up in that regard to try and keep things quiet and stable in the South China Sea, maintain economic relations and avoid conflict, but also to defend sovereignty. The one thing I think that could be very difficult in Australia-Indonesia relationship is if conflict arises in Papua. Prabowo is not going to tolerate any increase in the secessionist activities in Papua. Some of the human rights allegations against him relate to some pretty atrocious behaviour by troops under his command in Papua, which is not really disputed. The only issue is whether he was directly involved in those events. So he has a bad record in Papua. He's, I think, feared in Papua. And if secessionism increases in Papua, we would expect him to respond quite aggressively to that, quite intolerantly. And that, I think, would create a problem for the Australian government. We've been talking so much about Prabowo. Let's take one final moment to look at Jokowi, the soon-to-be ex-president. Will he go off quietly into the sunset? I think the fact that he backed Prabowo's presidency was never a given. That was his calculation of where his interests were best served, particularly uh, his relationship with Megawati and his former party, the PDIP, when they um, they put up their presidential candidate, Gunja Pranor. I think Jokowi could see that he wasn't going to have influence if he backed Pranor when Pranor was to become president. And my understanding is that, you know, Prabowo was the one who really started the idea or put forward the idea that Gibran could run with him. And he read Jokowi very well. In that he was looking around, he was open, and that he would be decisive. Whoever he backed was probably going to be the person who was going to win. So, you know, Jokowi made this calculation to try and consolidate his legacies. He's very focused on legacies around infrastructure, the new capital city in particular, which is his big project, the most resource-intensive single project in Indonesian history in terms of infrastructure. They'll have a lot of political implications for the country. Whether that pays off or not, I think, really remains to be seen. I'm not convinced at all, as we mentioned you know, previously, that Prabowo's interest in Jokowi extends a lot beyond riding his popularity to gain the prize of the presidency, which he now basically has that. And it will be managing Jokowi insofar as he continues to be useful to him. And if he's not, it would be a matter of trying to sideline him and Gibran as vice president, that was the idea that Jokowi's influence would be channeled through Gibran. Again, that's a risky strategy. As Tim mentioned previously, vice presidents are often lame ducks in the Indonesian system insofar as they only have as much power as the president gives them. We see the current vice president, Ma'ruf Amin, who again was essentially vice president as the outcome of political dealings with various groups to help consolidate Jokowi's power and since you know the, the running joke in Indonesia is is he still alive because he's been so much of a non-entity and I can imagine a similar situation with Gibran insofar as he's used to maintain popularity from the Jokowi effect until it's no longer needed so Jokowi's own position I think is quite vulnerable far less consolidated than many might think that it is uh, partly just because of, of Prabowo's own view of Jokowi's use value is to him. Jokowi is spectacularly popular with ratings after two terms of close to 80%, which is quite extraordinary. And for much of the second term, there are kites being flown about a possible third term. In fact, there are attempts, discussions about amending the constitution to give him a third term, which didn't get anywhere. And so Jokowi, with his immense popularity and having become one of the most effective political operators in recent Indonesian history and therefore enormously personally powerful, sees this Prabowo-Gibran partnership of a way of maintaining influence and becoming, I think, a kingmaker. He does not want to abandon power and I think he has good reason past presidents are very vulnerable in the Indonesian system. Jokowi is popular, but he has a lot of political enemies. And I think he sees this as a way of not just ensuring his legacy, but protecting himself and his family. There's not much else he could have done beyond this to achieve that. But as Ian says, it all depends on Prabowo and how that pans out. And I think Jokowi may find that extremely difficult in the years ahead. Just one last point, and this is something that's being discussed a little bit in Jakarta. Effectively, Jokowi is a heartbeat away from the presidency in the sense that if Prabowo, who's 72 and is not a healthy man, 
were to die, Gibran would constitutionally be sworn in as the next president, which would effectively mean that Jokowi had control of the presidential office. And I don't think that's a million miles away from Jokowi's thoughts. Our guests have been Professor Tim Lindsay of the Melbourne Law School and Dr. Ian Wilson of Murdoch University. Thank you very much, both. Thanks. Thank you. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 29th of February 2024. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Kelvin Parham of Profactual.com. Air to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons Copyright 2024, the University of Melbourne. I'm Sammy Shah. Thanks for your company.